Hey, mushroom friends, it's Anna McHugh. I'm uh, hanging out in my backyard with some of the fall uh, time mushrooms that I've been finding in the last couple of days. So I wanna share with you uh, a few of the specimens I've picked up. So I've got some purple mushrooms. I've got some toothy mushrooms that I really like to eat. These are hedgehogs and a couple of other things. I have a, a puffball uh, situation as well. So uh, this is a reasonably small collection. We have uh, at the end of the season, sort of a, a changeover from a lot of, uh, you know, mushrooms that are very abundant in the summertime, like chanterelle mushrooms, uh, that start to, you know, disappear and go to sleep for the winter. However, we have in the uh, southeastern U.S. this wonderful sort of fall mushroom season. It's a nice, relaxed way to come in for a smooth landing and, and hopefully emotionally last until morel season comes in the spring. So I want to show you some of my favorite characters uh, that you can find during this time. And we're um, mid-October or so. So, you know, until I suppose the middle of November in North Carolina, I'll expect to see some mushrooms. And it really depends, of course, on how much rain we get and how cold it gets. So, uh, but the first thing, and I've shared this on the channel before, but I will never stop sharing them. So this is a hedgehog mushroom in the Hiddenum genus. I am going to call this, uh, you know, Hiddenum subgenus alba. I can't get any further than that without, uh, you know, microscopic identification. Suffice it to say, we have um, 16 or 17 at a minimum uh, hedgehog type species in the eastern U.S. Fortunately, they're all edible and they're all delicious. So, uh, you know, in the fall time, I start to see them in my chanterelle patches in larger numbers. So you have in subgenus Alba, they're uh, sort of a whitish, you know, really pale color. They have little teeth underneath and those can be kind of fragile. So, you know, you um, want to be aware that like when you cook them, they can start to not really fall apart, but you'll see the teeth get distributed through ever, you know, if you're stirring it up vigorously. Uh, so you also, despite it being a really um, pale colored mushroom in subgenus Alba, a lot of the species have a uh, sort of orange reaction that, you know, this sort of staining thing that happens once the mushroom's been handled. Now these uh, particularly have what I would consider a really, really faint staining reaction. So I picked these up yesterday and actually, um, sliced open one of the stems and as you can see it's you know it's kind of a brownish uh orange color but some of the uh hedgehogs in subgenus alba you know you handle them and it's almost like there's you know they have an inner carrot that just wants to burst forth into song and so the second you handle them they just turn you know completely orange uh, these mushrooms have a really wonderful flavor. They're nice and firm. And one of the things I like about the fall and wintertime uh, species is that they are less likely to get um, infected by bugs or not infected, that's the wrong word, uh, less likely to compete with me uh, for the mushrooms themselves. All right, so that is uh, probably the thing I'm most delighted about with what I found um, yesterday. But I do wanna share a mushroom that I appreciate aesthetically a great deal. And someone uh, convinced me that I really haven't given it enough, um, enough of a good shot. So uh, from an edibility perspective. So this is Lacaria ochropoporia. It is an edible mushroom and I'll show you how to identify it in just a minute. Uh, but, you know, historically, I, it's one of those mushrooms where I'm like, yes, I've tried it, and I was kind of underwhelmed. But somebody, some faithful soul on the internet was like, you really need to spend a little more time cooking this thoroughly, only, you know, try the cap, because I had, you know, used the stem, and it was all kinds of uh, fibrousness, and I was just disappointed by the whole thing. So anyhow, uh, you know, I am going to avail myself of that. And that may be, like, if I find them to be delightful, uh, that's great news because Lacaria ochropoporia is one of the more common mushrooms that I find around Raleigh, uh, North Carolina, where I live. So I find them growing in, uh, you know, oak groves typically. I don't know actually what their associate is, but usually I'm hanging out in oak and beech groves primarily, and they just grow in great abundance. And so what you have going on is, of course, the most conspicuous thing about this species is it has this really uh, sort of 
obtrusive purple color, uh, you know, and the gills are very widely spaced. Here's a much larger specimen. So you can see, you know, it's just this loud, uh, loud colored and widely spaced gill situation. Also, the gills are kind of deep. Uh, and so, you know, you have a lot of mushrooms where the gill layer, there's just not nearly as much blade here. So, uh, you know, and again, the color is sort of a, like lilac purple if you turn it up to 11. So I find these mushrooms to be really sort of fun and cartoony. Now, when you approach them, they don't look nearly as impressive. So, you know, it's just sort of a cap and stem dealy that looks a little bit, uh, a little bit faded, but a little bit lavender uh, or lilac colored. But as you approach again, you flip them over and you get this, you know, really ridiculous situation. Um, they also oftentimes have uh, a little uh, sort of, um, I don't know, depression in the center of the cap. I have picked up a couple or well, one of the youngest specimens. So you can see that divot right in the middle and it almost has a look like a little chess piece, but this will get to be a much larger uh, mushroom with time. But I wanted to show sort of, you know, the range in color uh, or excuse me, the range in size is about from, you know, this to this. Uh, so as far as edibility is concerned, again, I mentioned that people like to eat the caps. I'm going to give them a little more of a, like, you know, sincere and earnest try. Um, other features to note, uh, at the base of the stem, you'll oftentimes see sort of a little bit of, uh, like purpley colored, uh, it's, it's not like mycelium clinging to it, but, um, you know, you'll oftentimes see a little bit of floofy purpleness here. Um, another thing, let me see if it's still retained on this, yeah, specimen that I've been shaking around. It's kind of may be a little bit difficult to see, but often you'll see these little webs, uh, you know, and I don't know if they're, uh, you know, little arachnids or what, but you oftentimes will see just a very, very fine webs inside of uh, the, you know, the gills here. And I mentioned that uh, for a couple of reasons. So we do have lookalikes for Lacaria ochroporporia. So we have bluet mushrooms, which is Clytosa nuda, another mushroom that is a good edible. But we also have a number of mushrooms in a genus, I'm gonna say in quotes, Quartinarius, because it's transitioning to all kinds of different things. This is a Quartinarius mushroom, but uh, you know, obviously is not purple in color, but there are numerous ones that are purple in color. And in general, people discourage uh, eating Quartinarius mushrooms because there are some that are very problematic. So, uh, you know, I mentioned the webbiness because it's almost like those uh, webs that appear on Lacaria ochropoporia are um, insecty type webs. I don't know what they are, but in the case of a Quartinarius mushroom, you will absolutely have webbiness that occurs that is actually a part of the mushroom itself. So in order to distinguish, you know, a Lacaria ochropoporia from a Quartinarius mushroom, Again, this is a kind of poor comparison, but let's go ahead. Let's go ahead and try it out. So, uh, you know, they look very similar in a lot of ways as far as being capped and stemmed and they have gills. Uh, but, you know, uh, Cortinarius in this specimen isn't great for it, but it has what's called a cortina. So it's a sort of webby substance that will sometimes form a really prominent ring on the stem. And sometimes you'll even see, you know, little bits of it, but it is actually part of the mushroom itself. Totally different from this like little bits of white, you know, cobwebs or what have you that's so common on older uh, Lacaria mushrooms. The other thing that'll keep you, uh, you know, on track with the Cortinarius versus Lacaria identification is the uh, gill and spore color. So as you can see, uh, Cortinarius has really dark brown rusty gills and that's the sort of typical expression of a quart mushroom. So, um, you know, if you see a mushroom that has even sort of moving toward a, uh, you know, rusty color and has a little bit of webbiness on or around the margin of the cap, you may well have a quart in hand. Uh, but, you know, as far as uh, the identification, you really, once you start to look at this mushroom a few times and then look at purple quartinarius and Clytosa nuda, you can just Google purple mushrooms and you'll get a lot of really interesting things. But, um, you know, Lacaria ochropoporia is so common and this color really compared to the other mushrooms in this general set of, you know, color hues, it's very, very distinctive. So anyway, this is one of those like, you can learn it and it is very well worth learning because it's a fantastic mushroom to take pictures of. All right.
let's move on to a uh, edible puffball mushroom. So this is Calvatia cyanthiformis. So um, this is a puffball mushroom that you'll oftentimes this time of year find, uh, you know, growing in grass. They're really nice to eat when they are nice and firm and white all the way through. And Calvatia cyanthiformis um, is uh, distinguished from its relatives in uh, the Calvatia genus by having sort of a purple brown spore uh, deposit. So, and it's called a, a gleba. So basically, let's take this apart and we'll talk about We'll talk about how puffballs are put together. Okay, so what you have is a, you know, it's just a glob of fungus essentially. And it's actually pretty, uh, you know, robust as far as like you can't really squish it. So these are relatively flesh, so fresh. So let's see how this fresh flesh looks. All right, kind of sort of gross. Um, which is a shame. I mean, not not super duper bad, but it's not for me. Okay, so however, that's mostly because uh, what I have going on is some bug damage, and I'm just not really into that. So, uh, you know, that said, like if you open up a puffball mushroom, if it is overly mature, the center, this gleba, that's uh, gonna turn into the spore mass, will um, become sort of discolored from a, you know, really uh, sort of cream white color. Uh, in the case of Calvatia cyanthiformis, that is a purple brown, as I mentioned. So it basically becomes a purple purple brown, you know, bag of spores, and it's very fun to poof and so forth. But uh, you know, before it matures, you can have you know a nice uh, sort of uh, like white bread appearance almost. It's it's not super crumbly. It's more um, like a really really dry tofu, and that's how oftentimes people uh, prepare it. And so, uh, you know, you want it to be nice and, uh, you know, firm and whitish all the way through. And again, the reason I am not going to eat this in particular is it has um, maggot damage here, and I'm just not into the into the maggots this year. So uh, the thing that you want to also be mindful of is that we have uh, other puffball mushrooms. There's one called uh, Calvatia craniformis. So it looks very similar uh, to this dude, but you know, it has more of a, a neck on it and it looks more like a neck and brain. And it's uh, oftentimes a little more uh, sort of, you know, crenellated and whatnot. All right, so let's open this one up and it's got less, less bug damage in it. So I may actually trim this one up and eat some of it. But uh, you know, again, as this mushroom gets older, it will start to turn purple black inside. And the outside is, it's not complete, like there's, there's not a ton of features, but you do have a little bit of scaling. Uh, and you know, the, the outer layer is definitely uh, a distinct sort of um, skin that surrounds the mushroom. But yeah, it's, it's, um, kind of, uh, you know, becomes patterned and uh, you start to see sort of little patches of, uh, you know, mushrooms that you have fissures develop between them as it dries out. So uh, anyway, that is Calvatia cyanthiformis. You want to be mindful not to mistake it for this bastard. So this is uh, Scleroderma citrinum. Um, also known as the, I think, poisonous pigskin puffball is one of the things people call it. So basically it's just a little, you know, here, this is what it looks like when it's on the ground. And so, you know, sometimes people will look at it and say, okay, I could see maybe this is a, you know, an edible puffball of some kind. I want to, you know, flip it over and see what's going on. And once you open up this mushroom, almost immediately though, you're going to notice, first of all, it's really, really sort of um, you know, fibrous and brittle, but also on the inside, uh, this gleba, this, you know, spore mass is blackish and oftentimes has like, it almost looks like quartz or a little granulated, but, uh, you know, it is definitely a different critter and this is, uh, you know, toxic. So you don't want to eat this. So really the long and short on puffballs is that, you know, you have a number of different species, some of them much, much smaller than uh, Calvatia cyanthiformis, but you want to be mindful that it doesn't have this sort of like blackish uh, with little flecks of white uh, and also very hard to open up that, you know, scleroderma is fun to take pictures of, but uh, not good to eat. All right, let's see, what are we gonna do now? I'm almost at the end, I think. Oh, um, yeah, I wanna show you guys a uh, Gymnopus dryophilus mushroom. And I, I hesitated there because there's a lot of taxonomy stuff going on with, um, 
all mushrooms, but you know, right in the area of um, sort of Clytosabe and Calibia and Lapista, and there's all these genera that are sort of getting put in bags, shaken up, and a whole bunch of new genera are popping out. It's very exciting. But this is a mushroom I, you know, it could, it could already have been renamed by the time I film it. So that's why I paused so long before picking it up. But what the heck? All right, so this is a super common little guy that we find growing uh, kind of everywhere everywhere on the forest floor. And uh, yeah, yeah, it's uh, Gymnopus dryophilus is the name that I know it by. And it's a really kind of delicate little character. The thing I really like about it is how it has these very tight packed little white gills. And so it's really sort of, um, you know, almost greasy or soft on the top with these just adorable little tight packed gills. And uh, they are uh, typically attached to the stem. And the stem is a little bit on the, uh, you know, uh, it's a little tough and stringy. So overall, you have just this little guy that you'll find it absolutely everywhere. So I enjoy uh, encountering it because well, I don't know. If I can't find any other mushrooms, I can find itty bitty little Clytosabes and uh, Gymnopus dryophilus, or whatever they're calling it this week. Uh, thank you very much for your time. I hope you find a lot of cool fall mushrooms, and we'll do this again soon.